Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Coaching Call podcast. On this podcast, we'll cover various types of coaching by trainers in sports, martial arts, fitness, and business. We'll discuss each coach's methods to getting the most out of their respective athletes or clients and how they attempt to change the platform in which they coach. Join us on a fun adventure as we discuss unique coaching styles. We've all been coached before, in school, at work, or on a team. Your first coaches were your mom and dad who taught you how to communicate, tie your shoes, or play a simple game of catch. Coaching is a universal part of how we get others to get something done. Join your host, Raphael, and his guests on this unique journey in coaching. Hi, I'm Sifu Raphael, and this is the Coaching Call Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. This episode was made possible by listeners like you. If you enjoy my show, go ahead and buy me a cup of coffee. Make it a large. To donate, go to paypal.me slash Raphael. That's S-I-F-U-R-A-F-A-E-L. I'm trying to keep this podcast free of advertisements. Anything you can donate is greatly appreciated. Thank you. I really appreciate your support. My guest today is Bob Wheeler. Bob's passion is to help others gain insight about how their emotions trigger financial decisions, combining finances with behaviors. Bob, thank you so much for joining me on Coaching Call. How are you today? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Likewise, likewise. We're going to talk money. Who doesn't love money? This is awesome. Money is nice. <laughs> Before we get into it, I have a question. Yeah. Why is money green? <laughs> because it grows on trees. Because ah, it grows on trees. There you go. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> That's well, it's not all money. Not all money is Correct. green. It just yeah. happens to be green in the USA. Depends on where you are. True, true. Let's talk about why money has such an impact on people. Yes, it, it can change someone's life. But when people only focus on money, they're missing the bigger picture. Thoughts? Well, absolutely. Well, here's the thing. Money has been around as an exchange since the beginning of time. So whether it was pillars of salt, whether it was gallons of water, whether it was goats, we have been using some kind of exchange since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. The thing these days, we sort of forget that, that it's really an exchange. And we think if I can hoard more than everybody else, I can get the most and I can get the biggest mountain and I can have the biggest house. And so I think we get sidetracked and we get distracted about what money can do for us. I think money can do amazing things. We can use it in service. We can use it to better our lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when we lose sight of that and make it just about the money, I think we lose track. And I think we actually we actually don't find happiness or joy yeah. because we're so busy in the pursuit of getting more. Yeah. Let's talk about when you realized money was what really did it for you. Because you, I mean, that's your profession, right? When you help people understand personal finances and all these other things, how young were you when you realized that, holy cow, I have a passion for this? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think I started out, I always enjoyed money and people sort of joked around me that I was sort of the Michael J. Fox from that, whatever that TV show long ago, where he was always trying to make money. Mm. I don't think I was quite that passionate about money, but I, but I was aware of the power of it. And I think at an early age, I grew up in a big family and there were things that we could not do. Mm. And we did not go out and have big lavish dinners with seven people going out for sushi. We were excited to get to go to McDonald's maybe every couple of months. We, most of our meals were from home and my mom made our clothes Exactly. You know, and I remember in high school not being able to take my parents had gotten divorced and I was not able to take the junior high or the freshman trip to uh, Gatlinburg because we didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And it was probably 200 bucks. And I remembered, wow, when you don't have money, you don't have choice. And I wanted to change that. So family of seven, huh? Yeah. Big family. Big family. I'm number 10 of 12. <laughs> so, all right, uh, you win. <laughs> I, it's not about winning, right? And, and it's it's about understanding where you're coming from. 
my first toy was at the age of 10. Yeah. A, a store bought toy. Right. That was my first toy. And it wasn't by my parents. My sister happened to be dating a musician. He was a singer, a Spanish singer who owned a record store. And for some reason, he went on a date with her and she brought me along. And I guess she was taking care of me or something. And I guess he said, let me quiet this kid. He's in the back of the car. Let me buy him something. He bought me a toy car. And that was my first toy. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. I understand where you're coming from. Exactly. I think that gives us an appreciation that some people don't have. Mm, absolutely. And you talk about the emotions of money, right? In your podcast, because you have a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. tell, tell me a little bit about your podcast as well. Yes. Yeah. So I have a podcast called Money You Should Ask. And what I do is I have conversations with people. I've talked with the former head of uh, Goldman Sachs. I've talked with successful globe winners. I've talked with people that are multimillionaires that like I've all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of that conversation is to find out beliefs that they had as children. And it's so amazing, regardless of how successful you are, regardless of how much money you have, people have issues around money. And that once you can start to understand, at least from my perspective, that things are relational and not transactional. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I think we start to like see the payoff. Right. It's, it's very interesting when you said as children, what our perceptions are, because yeah. money to me is not important. Right. You know, it, it's yes. Don't get me wrong. You can buy things with money. Right. But it's all materialistic thing. Right. And my feeling is, yeah, I want to work hard enough so I can get this. But if I don't get it, maybe I'll enjoy something else in the process. And if something breaks, I don't worry about it because it's a material thing. Right. If someone gets hurt, I worry about it because it's a person or an animal. So the, that's where my correlation with money is. And it could be from my upbringing. Absolutely. How do you help somebody understand that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I work with people, one of the first things I do is we look at family history. Mm. We look at cultural upbringing. Did I grow up in a uh, conservative religious background? Did I have grandparents that played a strong role? I look at all of that stuff because a lot of the decisions we make today were based on information we got when we were four, five, six, and seven. And we took that in as truth rather than it might have been a story mm -hmm. or it might have been some information, misinformation that our parents gave us. Right. And so we really have to do some excavating. And that's where I start is we start looking at what did your parents say or not say about money? How did you see them? Did they talk about money or did they fight about money? Did your parents, when you asked for something, tell you you were selfish and greedy or did they tell you, well, not today because we have a budget? Like, how was all that formed in those early years? Once we can start to really get a sense of that, we can then start to look and trace our current present day reactions and how we, we deal with money. We can usually trace it back. To, oh, my God. When I was seven, I remember this thing that happened. Right, right. And then we unpack it. When, when you talk about what your parents said or did or didn't do. This story always comes back to me. That happened to me. The ice cream man is coming. And I run home and I say to my dad, Dad, the ice cream man is here. I need a quarter. Back in the day, it's a quarter. And my dad yeah. would look around and says, well, you got to mop the floor or you got to clean this room. And I'm like, but the he'll be gone. Doesn't matter. You want the quarter. You do this now. I was like, oh. So at a very early age, I understood that I couldn't have what I wanted when I wanted it. So right. what can I do about it? At the young age of 10 years old, a friend, his brother was working in a bingo hall cleaning and his brother was 17. I'm 10 years old, but I was very tall already. And so I got friendly with the brother and I said, how do I get a job here? Because he was making good money. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, I have a couple of shifts I can give you. Okay. I wound up taking a few of his shifts, got right into it. At 10 years old, I was making a good paycheck every week and it was cash. It was $100 a week wow. for a 10-year-old. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, oh, yeah. So if I work hard, there's a reward at the end. I wish I had all that money I made when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't even know what happened to it. I probably spend it on all my friends. But one thing I did do, I stopped asking my parents for money. Yeah. And if, I had, if I had to buy sneakers, if I had to buy anything, I no longer 
felt that I had to ask because I was able to provide for myself. At the young age of 10, I understood that. And so my parents, having so many kids, had to help all these kids out. And so there was one kid they didn't have to help anymore. Right. (laughs) Which is awesome. You know, some kids might take away from that is I'll never ask anybody for help ever again. Mm. And they could go down the road of bitter and resentful. Uh, And other people could say, oh, this is so self-empowering. I love actually getting to decide when I want things. Yeah, that's why I'm not attached to materialistic things. I'm just not. How do you help someone who, who is looking to expand their, say, portfolio? Someone who is looking to maybe invest? Someone who is looking to level up their finances? Yeah. A lot of times people will come to me and say, look, I want to be better financially. I want to have some money in savings. I want to invest. But there's just never enough money. Mm. It's, but you know, I, as soon as I get this bonus or as soon as I get this, this inheritance, um, I'm going to start doing it. And I can tell you that never happens. The bonus isn't coming. The inheritance isn't coming. And it's not going to go towards savings even when it does. What I get people to do is set up, just as a starter, I get people to set up five, six, seven different online bank accounts and put 20 bucks here and five bucks here. And I just have them automatically. And these accounts are not linked to their checking account. So if they go into overdraft, they can't have that money. (laughs) Um, And I do it in little baby steps, little... 20 bucks here, five bucks here. And so every week, some money's coming out, going to these five, six, seven different accounts. As they get comfortable, oh, that's the 25 that went to Capital One. Oh, that's 10 bucks that went to ING or Ally Bank or Immigrant. And, and, and so I get them in the habit so that we can at least get enough money saved up. And then I can take a chunk of that. I can move it into an investment account, mm. an E-Trade, a Robinhood. There's lots of great little companies out there that don't require a whole lot of money for investing. Right. And for a lot of people that are scared to invest in the stocks and stuff like that, I'll say, well, how about just a mutual fund? Um, like a Vanguard fund. Let's start with something that doesn't require a lot of knowledge. They're pretty solid and just get comfortable with, oh yeah, I've got some money in my brokerage account. Mm -hmm. Got some money in my online savings account and getting people comfortable. Because what I've discovered is if you're used to having a thousand dollars in your bank account, the minute there's 3000 bucks in there, you're going to bring it right back to a thousand bucks. No question about it. So if I can get that money out and put it in different accounts so you're not counting it, we can self-trick ourselves right. into actually, like, right, we have to have safeguards against ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, myself included. Mm. I'm looking at my one main account. That's the money account. So if I move a money out of that other, uh, to other places, oh, I don't see it. That, oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Oh, that's right. I've got 100000 over there. But it doesn't count because right. it wasn't in my, my main account. So I try to get people to move that money out so they're not seen in that place because we get comfortable with, I'm comfortable with a thousand. Mm-hmm. I'm comfortable with not being overdrawn. And, and we want to build on that and start to feel comfortable with, oh, look, I have money in savings. I have money in investments. Right, right. So it's, it's almost like found money, right? Yeah. But it's actually your money. <laughs> it's actually your money. <laughs> if you think about it, people have the, the biggest fear of loss, right? But with gain, mm-hmm. not as much. Except when you find money, you know, like if you're going through your, your trousers, if you're a man, or if you're going through your purse, or if you're going through your drawers, and all of a sudden there's like a $20 bill, like, oh, yes, go, right? Yeah, I, I, and then they spend it right. <laughs> instead of, right. let me put it aside. Let me put it in a piggy bank or something like that. So I totally get where you're coming from. And it's a, an amazing idea. I started teaching that to my kids. Mm-hmm. So I, I had, I, I took them to to a bank. And I said, we're going to open up four accounts for each of my kids. You get four accounts, you get four accounts. And I also said, we need piggy banks. So Mm -hmm. you have four piggy banks for their birthday. They got money. And I said, okay, take half of it and then split it up, put half of it, spend it, whatever you want to do. The other one you put into these accounts. And then my kids got older and then they kept looking at the piggy banks. I don't want to put the money in there, dad. I'm like, why not? Well, I want to go buy this. I said, well, you should save to go buy that. And unfortunately, they didn't fully listen to me (laughs) because at one point I said to them, I said, look, actually, they were 14 or 15. And I said, I'm no longer holding on to your piggy banks. Here they go. They're for you to handle. You do whatever you want with them, but it's on you. 
not on me anymore. I've taught you how to do it. It's up to you to do it. Now, I know right now they're not doing it. Right. So, but I have to let them fail. That's right. So they can understand that, hey, there is something here, right? Absolutely. And I think that's so important, that piece that you're saying about letting them fail, because some parents would go in and go, how stupid are you? And they would shame them or make them wrong, which is not going to do anything for anybody. Correct. It's being able to hold the space of saying, you're on your own. I've given you some tools. I hope you use them. I'm not going to force it, but uh, go in peace. (laughs) (laughs) Make wise decisions. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's what we should hope for our children, right? Yeah, absolutely. Even helicopter parents, you know, have to let go at one point. Yeah. It's, it's so important. And, and, and being able to have healthy relationships with the kids about money, being able to talk to them and being able to say, if you go out and you lose the money, or it's great to be able to save or what, or, or setting the boundary of we're not going to be able to do that today, but here's why it's not because you're a horrible person. It's, it's, it's just not in the budget mm-hmm. or we don't have the income that your friend has. Right. And, and, and just actually have honest conversations instead of trying to present or deflect by making the kids wrong. So I think it's so important to start having early conversations um, with kids around money, include them in some of the family decision-making. You don't have to have them plan your 401k investments at five years old, but you do want to bring them into the conversation. You know, a lot of relationships have hard times because of money, Yeah, right? That's one of the biggest issues. And it could be because two people get married, one makes more than the other, and then there's that that divide. And then you have people who get married and said, let's put all of our money together. And then you have people say, let's put all of our money together, but I'll still have my account and you have your account. Which one of those do you think would be the safest and most practical? Well, I definitely think it's different for everybody. But in this day and age, I think for a lot of people to feel self-empowered, I like people to each have their own Mm. and a joint. I find that to be the most effective because even if somebody is not making all the money, but they're taking care of the kids or they're doing, they're doing something else that contributes to the, the marriage, the relationship, they shouldn't have to be beholden to the other person to hold the purse strings. And so I think it's important that each person have their own fun account or whatever you want to call it, that they don't have to justify to anybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether you budget 50 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month or a thousand bucks, It's that's your money. You get to do what you want with it. You can help out your spouse, whatever. And then each of you contribute so that it might be that one contributes 70% of their paycheck and the other one contributes 30% of their paycheck or, or, you know, they may not be contributing the same dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. But I do find that in this day and age, I think it's important to do the teamwork. So have that joint account that bills are paid from and also be able to have your own identity and not have to justify when you want to go get a massage or an ice cream without, without having to explain yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I was part of a conversation and I'm, I'm listening, a gentleman who said, if my wife goes out shopping for food, this is for the family. And she spends yeah. over this amount, she's going to have to pay, you know, she's going to have to listen to him go crazy on her. Wow. And to myself, I'm thinking, she's shopping for you, buddy. <laughs> what yeah. are you crazy? So people put limits on what other people can spend. So he's basically controlling who who she is, what she can do. Meanwhile, it's she was actually shopping for food, not she wasn't going out shopping for a fancy purse or anything crazy of that nature. But you I I, I agree with a hundred percent that everybody should have their own money because we don't live in the day and age where people stay married for long anymore. It's a shame. Right. But that's the truth. So yes. Right. Having a joint account, I agree with 100%. Having your own money, yes, I agree. Then let's talk about a man and woman come together. Or men and men, women and women. We live in a different world now. Whatever it is, the dynamic of a couple sometimes is changed by the someone, their finances become elevated because of jobs and so forth. And now there's resent yeah. from the other person. How do we talk someone into understanding your own value and appreciate the value of your your partner? Yeah, it's a hard conversation. Uh, Not everybody wants to have it. When I sit down with couples, one of the first things I ask them is, are you on the same team or are you trying to 
Like, does somebody need to win here? Mm. And because I have a lot of clients that are, tell my husband they're wrong. Tell my wife they're wrong. And I always say, which team, are you guys on separate teams? Are you try, Who's trying to win? Oh, oh, no, no. Okay, we're together. So that's the first thing is I remind people that they came together mm-hmm. to be a team, not to actually fight each other. And then I actually, I get people to talk about what are their values? Like, do, why did you come for, what, what did you like about this person? Was it because they had money or because they didn't have money? Was it because you could control them? Was it because they had a good heart? Was it because you, you know, you loved their amb- ambition or their energy? And I try to get a sense of like, what brought the two of you together? Mm. And, and then are you on the same page? Are you both spenders? Are you both savers? If one spends and one saves, what comes up for you? Mm-hmm. And so to have these conversations about, well, when I see you spend money without asking me, it takes me back to my childhood. And then I go to the story and then I start to tell myself, you don't care about me. Mm. And so then, okay, how could we do that differently? Right. What would make you feel better in the present? And we, and we start to have these conversations. And a lot of times, you know, I'll have, I have people come to my workshops and they'll say, my spouse won't work with me on this. I'm the only one trying to get the finances together. I said, okay, so if you probably go back to them and say, hey, I figured out what else you're doing wrong, you're not going to really get a lot of teamwork from them. But if you could go back to them and say, hey, listen, I'm really working on myself and I really want to do this better. And I'm wondering if I could get your support in helping me do this. Would you be willing? Most spouses are going to be on board in a heartbeat because they're not being attacked. Oh, heck yeah, I'll help you figure your stuff out. But in the process, it actually starts to become teamwork again when they start learning to communicate and, and actually being transparent with each other. Because if you're hiding stuff about money with your spouse, you're probably hiding other stuff as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you say hiding. My girlfriend's grandmother passed. But before she passed, they put her in a nursing home. It was time. And when they went through her house, they were finding money everywhere. In books, definitely in closets. and drawers and everywhere. And I'm like, my gosh, how much money did you guys find? Like, it was ridiculous. And that's the old school. They did not trust banks. Or that's right. Here's the other thing that I see sometimes, like you'll see a parent who will on the side sneak money to their child. What are they teaching? Yeah, they're teaching you got to keep that stuff a secret. Mm. You can't like you can't let everybody know or you know, I'm better than the other parent. Yeah. Yeah. I think (laughs) that's it. That's it right there. You should come to me. I'll help you. (laughs) I've got your back. Right. Right. Don't talk to your mom. I gotcha. Or don't talk to your dad. I gotcha. So it's that divide, right? Absolutely. And parents don't realize the, the effect that they're having on their children, not just with money, but if they, if the kids know that I can go to you for this, because my other parent is not going to help me out, then there is that divide. That is being created. Absolutely. I'm reminded of a story. I was working with somebody. They were getting ready to get married and they were concerned. Mm -hmm. And so I was asking them about their parents. And the one thing that this person learned from her mom was, don't tell dad that you buy anything new. He gets angry. So what you do is you buy a bunch of new stuff and you sneak it into the house and put it in the back of the closet for a month. Then you wear it. And when he says, that's new, you say, oh, no, I've had it for a while. Mm. Now, so that they weren't lying. Right. Now, what they were is lying because they set up a whole premise. Ultimately, those parents divorced. Mm -hmm. Right. But it also taught the daughter, you have to hide things from your partner because they won't approve. Yeah, that's a shame. As a kid, made you decide that I want to go into accounting. And and I'm going to tell you one thing. In the past, everybody had this premonition that all accounts are boring. Mm -hmm. You're definitely not boring (laughs) or dull, right? And my current accountant, he's, he's, he's a blast as well. But what prompted you to go into such a field that you have to, you know, really know all the regulations, the government is always changing things, and you have to be on your A game all the time. You have to be reading all these things reading between the lines, because if you're looking at what the government is sending us, right? Right. It's like, yeah, we're going to send you like 500 pages, but there's only like two paragraphs you really have to read. And then you have to decipher which two paragraphs are going to make the difference, right? Yeah. What prompted you to get into that profession? Well, so I have an interesting story. Let's hear it. I originally, I was, so I was fascinated with money. Um, I wanted to have lots of it. And initially from an early age, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to know the law Mm. and I wanted to make lots and lots of money. A friend of mine 
in high school said, you should take accounting. I think you'd be really good at it. And I took it. And I made straight A's and I went, oh, this is a great way to help my grade point average. Mm-hmm. So I initially started taking accounting just to help my grade point. And, and I loved it. But what I realized and why I ultimately got into accounting was, I think I grew up in a dysfunctional family. Mm-hmm. I'm sure other people did too. And the rules changed a lot. And I didn't like that. And accounting, two plus two is four. It's two plus two is four. One plus three is four. That's the number. That's the answer. You can't change it. And I loved the certainty Mm. of working with numbers because if I was off, I knew it was me. The system works. And so for me, I found a lot of comfort in that nice. initially. Nice. Of course, now I can manipulate the system, but <laughs> let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time it was, it felt very safe for me. Um, and it was something that came easy to me. Um, I actually felt guilty that it came so easy. Mm. But not for everybody, right? Not for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> not for everybody. Right. And I've known a lot of people who went into accounting thinking that that was their calling. And then they went to school, completed four years of college, came out, and that's not what they're doing. Because yeah. it, it depends on the type of job you get once you graduate, right? Yeah. So you went into accounting because you liked working with numbers. It gave you certain, yeah. mm-hmm. it gave you formulas. You understood yeah. it mm-hmm. and you thrived in it. Yeah. So you said, I'm going to pursue this. You went to college. What was your first job like? My first job, I was a hotel controller of a convention center in Memphis. We had four restaurants. We had about 200 people on payroll. And because I had gone to a good college that they knew of and that had a very solid accounting department, I was just basically, they gave the job to me over older people. Mm. And so I went in there very inexperienced, but very determined. And of course, young and, you know, a graduate, I knew everything. And so I, I, I actually did really well there. I I learned all the names of everybody, of all the 200 people working in the place. I knew all the housekeepers and everybody. You know, that was a hard job because he didn't believe in computers. Hmm. He was like, wow, lead pencil number two. That's how you do your numbers. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is rough. But I got to learn like the, the really elementary aspects of accounting from like from old school, super old school. You're doing this, but. You have the you pursued your your stand up comedy. Let's talk about that. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah. So um, you know, so I I got my CPA license and realized you got to make extra money. So stand up comedy is obviously the way to make lots of extra money. No, I I had always enjoyed comedy, making people laugh, and I realized uh, sitting in the back in an accounting office is probably not the place to be discovered being funny. And so I started doing, I started doing stand-up comedy. And for me in the real world at the time, I could sit with my clients and have a great conversation. Mm -hmm. But if you put 10 people in the room, I became tongue tied. I was terrified. Mm -hmm. I felt really comfortable in my seat across from one or two clients. And I didn't always feel comfortable telling people, Hey, I'm mad at you, or I'm frustrated or, but stand up was a place for me to be able to say outrageous things and then just go, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Right. So it was a place for me to actually have my voice. <laughs> Were you? Were you? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no <you're> not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Did you get any hecklers? Um, you know, sometimes you do and you just learn to play with it. You know, sometimes weird stuff happens. I remember one time I was getting ready to go up and do this show and there was, I don't know, 250 people, 300 people in the audience and the, the room was just popping and everybody was having a good time. And this drunk lady just gets up and starts screaming um, after the last comic. She's just screaming and she's just sc- uh, shouting obscenities. And then just walks out and everybody's just like, what just freaking happened? And the whole energy in the place shut down. And I'm like, and they're like, come to the stage, Bob Wheeler. And I'm like, oh my God. Right. <laughs> so I just run up and I was like, give it up for my mom. She loves to drink and come to the clubs, but she never stays for my set. Right. And perfect. People loved it. And so naming the obvious in the room is a way to get people back on your side. Yeah. And so I, I loved, I, you know, I love, when I'm up there and getting to connect with people, seeing people laugh mm-hmm. and, and saying things that resonate with people right. that they would normally say, but they know what we're talking about. What I'm hearing from you is that you know how to read a room. <laughs> oh, 
most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. But, but think about it, right? If you go into a corporate setting mm-hmm. and, and you look around 10 people, maybe 20, and you look around the room and they give you a spot where you're sitting and just by the facial expressions, what people are doing, you're a- are you able to read that room? Yeah, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten comfortable. I've gotten so comfortable where in the past I would say I was terrified, but I've gotten so comfortable in a room that if I have to stand up and take charge of the room or I get called on to do something, I realize most people are terrified or quietly hoping nobody's going to call on them. And I'm comfortable with knowing I may not do it perfect, but I'm doing it. So uh, that gives me a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what you just said, confidence. Are most people confident financially? I think most people fake financial confidence. Mm -hmm. I think most people, my experiences, even my very successful clients, a good portion of them have a lot of shame um, that they should have more, that they made bad choices. And they're just trying to present it in the best light, hoping people don't notice the messy parts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I do with the people that I work with, whether it's tax clients, whether it's people that I'm coaching, whether it's people in workshops, I try to leave space to let them know they don't have to do it perfect. I don't have a judgment of them and that whatever they want to share with me is totally welcome. And, and so people share stuff with me that they were like, I've never told anybody this. Mm -hmm. I've never told my spouse this Um, because I want people to know that like, it's all welcome. There is no shame. Most of us didn't get anybody telling us what to do and they didn't teach it in class. And so I want people to feel confident that they're doing the best that they can. Mm -hmm. And so that, and and so I really want to hold that space for people. And I I think that's why, I think that's been one of the reasons that I've been successful is people do trust that I actually really care about them and that I'm really not there to shame them. I'm actually really help there to help them and be of service. Right. I, I love the fact that you mentioned trust. And then the other thought that came to my mind is keeping up with the Joneses. Right. Yeah. Because I, I, I live in Long Island, New York. and you can go from one neighborhood to the other, and one is very low class. And I don't, the people are not low class. Their right. finances are low. Right. Great people. And you can go to another neighborhood five minutes, 10 minutes away, and it's multi million dollar homes. And in some of those homes, there are people living in those homes who should not be living there. For sure. Because they're living way above their means. Mm-hmm. They are keeping up with the Joneses. They may not even have furniture in the house, but they just want the neighborhood. They want this, they want that. They're living in a materialistic world instead of a real world where they can be happy in a smaller home, in a different neighborhood. And sometimes, you know, when I said low class and I said, and, and I said what I meant by the people are not low class, right. but sometimes you have really low class people living in high, high end neighborhoods, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Absolutely. And you know, it it reminds me of uh, some people define that there's a say that there's a difference between rich and wealthy. Mm. Rich people are the people like, look at my big house. Look what the neighborhood I live in. Look, 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 look. And it's very ego based. Wealthy is I don't need to show you what I have. I have the ability to put my kids through college. I have the ability to do almost anything I want, but you're not going to know about it because it's really nobody's business. And that's not ego based. And so I think there are definitely a lot of people that want to present as super rich Mm -hmm. because of their own insecurities. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You said something about truth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trust, right? Truth and trust. So as truthful as you can be with a client, they have to trust that you are being truthful Mm -hmm. and you have to trust that they're being truthful with you. Right. So those two things go hand in hand. Yeah. Have you found that when you start working with people, they're not as honest as they should be? Oh, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, but here's the thing. Yes, that is true. People come to me and they try to skip over things. But as an accountant, you know, the the joke is that your accountant and your trash man know more about you than anybody else. Mm. Right. So I know where people hide the bodies. Yeah. I know when you're not telling me the truth because things don't add up. And so I can call people out on that in a way that other people can't. Um, That really helps me when I'm coaching and working with people because I've got this financial background. I'm not, I had a financial advisor say to me one time, we were talking about a client and he said, oh, well, this and this and this is going to happen for them. And I said, no, it's not. They go, no, no, I had a conversation. They told me this and they're doing that. Mm. I said, I looked at their numbers. 
They haven't saved any money. <laughs> They've just told you what you want to hear. And the financial advisor was devastated that his clients had, our cl- mutual clients had lied to him. But I, I, get, I do get to call people on their BS when I see it. Yeah. And it's only hurting. They're hurting themselves, right? Because then they can't make that financial decision to benefit from. Am I right or am I wrong on that one? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I work with people on budgets, I I do what I call honest budgeting. Mm -hmm. And I put a line item in there and I'll say to people, listen, if you have an addiction or a compulsion for spending, um, whatever it is, I just need to know about it. Like, I don't care what it is and I'm not going to judge you on it. But if you keep telling you come up short every month and you're spending 500 bucks a month on alcohol or purses, I sort of need to put that in the budget. Yeah. Just from a, just from a numbers point of view, you know, and they're like, what? And I'm like, you know, it's like, I got to know the truth Mm -hmm. because I can't help you. Right. Right. My martial arts school is next door to OTB. So there is where I'm seeing all this craziness because these people are coming in and I see them, they come out, they throw trash on the floor and it's because they're angry. And why are they angry? Yeah. Because they just lost the bet. They just gambled. Maybe they gambled their right. paycheck or maybe they gambled, you know, the groceries money. And so when we think about money, people have so many different ways of looking at it. Have you ever had to help a gambler? You know, I actually have not worked specifically with a gambler. Mm-hmm. Um, I have many clients that gamble, right. um, but I've never <laughs> had somebody that had an addiction around it. Right. Um, I have had people that have you know, spending compulsions and things like that. But really, and and in that sense, having to work with people about, you know, what's the belief system? What's the payoff in this compulsion? What's, I always look at things that as a cost benefit, right? So there may be a benefit to me gambling. I get to in the moment feel that I'm going to win, but the cost is I'm gambling away my my retirement. I'm gambling away my future. And so I really try to do things from a financial accounting point of view, but bringing in that emotional, compassionate piece so that we get the whole picture. You, you know, I, I go to Vegas often, and but I'm, I don't go to Vegas to gamble. Yeah. I go for the shows. I, I actually, I go to martial arts events and all this kind of things. I was at an event and they gave us a lunch break and we're outside the, the casino. So I go out there and the way I gamble, I take $100. And if, if I'm not worried about the $100, if I lose it, no big deal. So I take $100, I get chips. And if I win, I take the winning and I put it in my other pocket. Yeah. It's money I never had. Right. And then that's, and usually I always wind up having more than $100. So I, I came out a winner. But if, and there's been some times where I lost 100 I don't go looking to put another 100 in my pocket. That, that night's over. What, during this lunch break, I went out and said, oh, let me throw $20 on, on the roulette table. I didn't even know how to play roulette. Right. This is, it's, so I, I'm watching and watching. And somebody said, oh, you do this, you do that. Okay. This is many years ago. And I think I lost my $20. And there was a beautiful, blonde, voluptuous woman right next to me. And she goes, honey, you can't gamble with $20. So she goes, here's a 50. And she had, I think she had like $30,000. Wow. With chips. And because you can see them, I'm like, oh my goodness. I said, thank you so much. So I, 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 I asked for change of the $50 chip or whatever it was. And I got changed and I put a little bit and I wound up winning several hundred from her gift. Wow. Because I lost my 20 and I was, I was about to leave. And right. from her 50, I got several, I won several hundred dollars in like 30 minutes. And I said, thank you to her, walked away. I come out two, three hours after, and she, I see the same woman crying like crazy. She lost everything. Wow. Everything. And so I, I felt like maybe I should go give her $50 back. I'm like, no, this is not a good time. <laughs> so I said, she's only going to look at me and like, that's all you got. So I said, ah, I'll just walk the other way. But thinking about, wow, I was like, holy cow, I, I won like, Several hundred, I think it was like eight or nine hundred dollars in 30 minutes. And it was like money that wasn't even mine. Right. I could have said, oh, let me go and gamble some more. But I was like, no, yeah. that's 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 good for today. <laughs> I'm I'm done. Yeah. But when people put value on things, 
What are they really putting the value on? That's a question for you. Yeah, I think they're putting value on that somehow they're going to get karmic payback, that the universe is going to show them that they're deserving, that that some little deed that didn't get unnoticed. It's it's and you know it's un, it's unfortunate. It's why all the game shows, all these things they play on people like I'm going to go the whole I'm going to go for the whole thing. I was listening to a game host, it might have been um, Howie Mandel, but mm. said, you know, it's so heartbreaking because these people will get like 50, 80, 100,000. And instead of saying, yeah, I'll take the 80,000 and walk away, they'll lose it all in hopes that they'll get the big win. Statistics are against them. The house wins, right? But I think people have this hope that, you know what, it's going to be different. This is going to prove that I'm special. This is all the hard work that I've put in and never gotten paid for. I'm finally going to get my payoff. And it's really painful to see people living in that instant gratification belief that this is the moment instead of knowing that, like, if I put in the work, save my money, do the, do put in the effort, that that's what's going to pay off the dividends. Retire like a pro athlete who retires at the top of their game. Yeah. Not a pro athlete who keeps going and getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And then all of a sudden they're retiring because they nobody wants them anymore. Instead of retiring at the top of your game, right? Yeah. That's the level that we need to retire. So someone yeah. actually it was Gary Vanacek who said, uh, I was listening to him and he said, you know, if you worked hard your whole life and then you retire I don't think that you should be living in your yacht anymore. That that made me think, why? Why shouldn't you? And he said, yeah. because you, you lost, you gave up. Wow. So maybe I interpret it wrong, but he's like, he doesn't care if someone loses their yacht right. or their lifestyle because they didn't keep grinding. Yeah. I might have read it wrong. I, I might have heard it wrong. Yeah. But that's what you took. That's what I took. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? I think actually, I think people should be living the life they want to live now instead of waiting until they retire. Right. It's like, I'm not saying go out and blow all the money, but don't cheat yourself out of life experiences so that you can have all this money. I just was meeting with somebody a couple of days ago. They're selling a condo that they had as an investment and they're in their eighties. They're just turned 80. And they already have probably almost a million dollars in the bank, mm-hmm. but they're paranoid. They're conservative and old school. And so they're selling this condo. They thought that they were going to maybe walk away with three or 4,000, but they're going to walk away with $650,000. And they are like, oh my God, this is, this is terrible. I've never had this much money. And I said, you're 80 years old. Here's what I'm going to tell you you have to do. You have to take $50,000 and you have to go out and do something you've never gotten to do and, and just do it. He said, I'm going to go blow $3,000 in Vegas. <laughs> and, and I said, great. And then you have $47,000 more you have to go use. He literally started tearing up because he wouldn't give himself the permission. He's going to now have $1.5 million. He's 80. Right. His house is paid off. Mm. And he still wouldn't give himself permission to go have some fun or take a vacation and I, until I said, you have to. Right. It's that guilt. It's the guilt. It's the guilt of, I don't deserve it, right? I don't deserve it. It's all going to go away. The minute I start enjoying it, it will be taken. We talked about investing earlier. If Mm -hmm. someone comes to you and they say, look, I make minimum wage, are you able to help? Absolutely. For me, it doesn't matter how much you make. It's about how willing you are to do the work with whatever you have. Um, I have people come in with lots of money and I'm not going to work with them. Or I'll have people come and say, you know, I'm ready to get my emotional finances in order. I said, great. Are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to feel uncomfortable? Nope. All right, we're done. Yeah. Because I want somebody that's committed. I will put in the time and energy because I'm less interested in how much I'm going to make. And I'm more interested in the relationship that I'm going to create. Mm-hmm. Nice. So you're a real coach. Someone I hope who, so. Someone I'm who in cares. A, like, Holy cow. <laughs> no wonder I like you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So many people have gotten in trouble with the government Mm -hmm. because they trusted their account. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. I, you know, trusting is great, but I like, I love the phrase trust and verify. Mm. If you think something's not good, check it out. I have people come to me and say, Hey, I'm not sure if my accountant's doing a great job. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about this or that. I'll take a look at their stuff. I'll get a sense of what they're being told. And I'll say, 
hey, they're right on point. They're doing you a great job and you're paying a great rate. I'm going to charge you three times what they're charging you. Stay with them. Um, <laughs> right. Or I will say, you know what? I have some concerns here. I've noted, I'm looking at all this. This doesn't tie to this, doesn't tie to that. I definitely think, you know, it's important that you trust your accountant. It's important that you can talk with them. I worked in a, before I had my own firm, I worked in a company and the, the CPAs would shame the clients. Mm. I would hear them on the phone. You're so stupid. Why would you, that's just the dumbest. I was like, who, I would never pay somebody to like shame me. Um, You know, I have my parents to do that. Um, (laughs) No, Um, no, I, I just, you know, it was just mind boggling to me that, that accountants would talk to people this way. And they're like, well, people are stupid. And you got I'm like, no, people are scared. Yeah. People call us. People don't call my office to annoy me. Call, people call me because they want comfort. And, and so what I want to do is I want to help people feel, I want people to sleep at night. Mm. So if you're not feeling comfortable about your accountant, you need to be seeing other accountants. <laughs> I, with my ex-wife, we had the accountant for the business and our personal, and then we're getting divorced. And I'm like, I like the guy. I'm going to use him. And then, so we have to separate the business, right? close the business, the whole deal. And he says that I have to pay all this money. And so I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. So one of my members' dad was an accountant, super nice guy. And I said, hey, you know, you're an accountant, right? He goes, yeah. I said, look at this letter. He goes, I, I said, I have to pay like $750. He goes, what for? I said, because that's my accountant said I have to pay him to, to you know, fill this out. He goes, really? He goes, I'll bring it to you tomorrow. I said, well, how much is it going to cost? He goes, don't worry about it. Yeah. Nothing. It costs nothing. Yeah. It was just him filling it out for me. Yeah. And so at that point, okay. In my mind, I was so dumb. I didn't say, wow, let me talk to this guy and see if he could be my accountant. Right. So at that point, I started looking for an accountant. My sister said, hey, you have to go to this account. I said, okay. I live in Long Island. I had to go all the way to Queens, which is about an hour away. I walk into this place. There is papers everywhere. He's got three or four people working there. I go, I'm waiting. I go into his office. There's stacks and stacks of papers everywhere. Underneath his desk, there's stacks and stacks. It looks like you light a, a match, that place is going to go poof. Yeah. And so I start talking to him, super expensive. And then he tells me he's not a CPA. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. And you're going to do? I said, nah, thank you. So I go outside and I'm like, how dumb am I? I said, I got to go. I got to call Mike. And I'm, you know, because I had his number. I, <laughs> I said, hey, Mike, can you make an appointment? He's like, yeah, come on over. And I've had him ever since. And I, I'll call him. He'll call me. And as, he's like, hey, what's going on? And we just, we talk, like you said, that trust, that confidence. Yeah. And, and, and I can call him anytime and he responds. And if he can't, he'll, he'll pick up the phone. And he'll go, let me call you back. You know, so it's that, that I know he's got my back. And, and you, you said it, it's, it's important to be able to. But here's the thing. Even though I trust Mike, I still question him all the time. Absolutely. And, and you should, you know. You should. Anybody who's dealing with your money, you should question. What is this about? What is going on? The new law came in. And if you don't know about it, your account should be telling you about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you do need to be able to talk to your accountant. I know so many CPAs and financial advisors that'll say, hey, Bob, here's a way you don't have to talk to your clients. If you do this and this, you could, you could spend less time with them. Well, I want FaceTime with my clients. <laughs> yes. I actually, I'm in relationship with my clients. They're not a transaction and I'm very protective of them. And so I look forward to engaging with my clients because that's where I learn most of the information anyway, is in the real conversations, I discover things. What advice would you give someone who is looking to either change accountants or they're, they're starting a business and they need an accountant? And before you answer, how do you feel? Uh, here's another question, maybe. How do you feel about these tax places that open up and just do it and then they close down? They open up for four months and then they close down. And then they come back around tax time. Yeah. Well, I'm not a fan of those. Me neither. <laughs> 12 months out of the year, we're here hmm. uh, because stuff comes up. It's not just tax time. Right. And, and sometimes those folks will, 
I've seen some crazy tax returns uh, just to help people get a refund that sh- will not survive an audit. Right. But it's in the moment. But when you're looking for an accountant, I think it's I think it's important to, to talk to two or three. And I would have some specific questions. And I would probably even ask a question or two that I already know the answer to, Mm. to see if the accountant knows the answer. I remember I was referred as one of three to a client of mine that I've had for 20 years. I came in, he showed me his tax return. He said, is there anything you would do different on this tax return? It was a C-Corp. I looked and I said, oh, well, you shouldn't have paid any tax. Why didn't anybody take the 179 depreciation? He goes, exactly. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I showed it to two other accountants. They did not catch that. And when I asked my current accountant, why didn't you take the depreciation? He said, I'm sure you're taking money somewhere else and you need to pay your fair share to the government. So I'm not going to take that election for you. And, mm. and I said, well, that's not my job. My job is to use the law in your favor. That's clearly something that you should have taken. And I got the, and, and, and he hired me uh, on the spot, but he knew what was wrong with the return. And I was the only person other than his current accountant that knew what was wrong with the return. And so it's important to know that like the people looking at your stuff and that you're talking to feel confident and and know what they're doing. Do you help people fix their credit scores as well? Um, I send people elsewhere to do that. Um, we typically don't do that. I mean, I have I know some strategies and and all that, but I, I typically we tend to let other people do that. We like focusing on getting people more money in their bank accounts, tax strategies, and then just again, I do a lot of work with people around their beliefs and and their emotional components to their to their finances so that we can get them on the right path. Yeah, because I had to, once I got divorced, I had to fix my credit score because my ex-wife was not paying the bills that I thought were being paid. Oh, right. So <laughs> that didn't help. So that 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 threw my credit score all the way down. I mean, I'm, I'm up almost 800 now, but when we think about money and we talked about how it divides people, emotional feelings, all these different things. And you said it's really a transaction. And it not now they have crypto, right? Now they have different ways of doing money. How scary is crypto? Well, you know, I know there's a lot of young people that are like, this is amazing. Let's just jump in and do it and give it a shot. Mm-hmm. And good for them. I tend to be a little more cautious. I work hard for my money. I also only spend $100 when I go to Vegas for gambling. I don't just throw my money around and hope something happens. Um, so for me, all this crypto stuff, you know, did I throw a little bit of money into it just to see? I did. Am I make, making money right now? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, look, I, I like a sure thing. Uh, I tend to be a little more conservative in my approach. I don't get excited until it's crossed the finish line. Right. So I tend to be a little more cautious. I think you should never put money into things like that unless you're willing to lose it. I think you have to be clear that crypto and investing in stocks can be just like gambling in Vegas. Yeah. And you've got to be willing to uh, take the loss, right. take the hit. Take that hundred and lose it. <laughs> yeah. So that means exactly. you and I can go gambling in Vegas. <laughs> we only lose a hundred and then we can go to great shows and great dinners. And Exactly. You know, I- I'm so happy that I got the chance to talk to you because, yeah, you know, I'm wondering how do you open up at the comedy store? Let me tell you the funny thing about money. Right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And money is not always funny. (laughs) No, no, it's not. Uh, Money has caused some people to lose their lives because of it. Yeah, Uh, for sure. So for sure. Let's let's find out how people can reach you You, because you're you're doing workshops. Yep. Are you doing them in person? Are you doing them virtual? Yeah, we're doing them virtually right now. We're going to start back up. We used to do live workshops. So I'll start that probably later this year. But right now I do have a, a, a money and vision um, group that meets every other week. I have an online course, Mastering the Emotions of Money, that you can do by yourself or with me as a coach. Nice. And then people can reach me at themoneynerve.com, N-E-R-V-E. I'm a nerd, but it's the money nerve. <laughs> and uh, they can reach out to me. I'm happy to talk with them. We've got great information. We've got tools. Um, access to the the podcast, access to the workshops. And we love just engaging with people and helping them get healthier with their money relationship. Awesome. Bob, this has been so much fun. You've taught me so much. Awesome. Now, should I keep my money in my piggy bank or should I bring it into the bank? Should I put it in a money market? Should I put it into an IRA? Should I put it into the stock market? (laughs) 
or should I just hide it under my pillow along with my piggy bank? I'd probably put it in the bank because uh, if your house gets burned down, your, your piggy <laughs> bank goes with it. Um, at least the bank's insured. Um, depending on how much you have, probably good to put a little bit in some mutual funds. I think they're a little bit more stable than stocks, especially if you're starting out. Um, but I think it's always good to put it in multiple places so that you are protected should one of them go amiss. And before we go, real estate, investing in real estate, thoughts on that? I think real estate is, yeah, real estate is a great, I mean, even though there's a lot of craziness going on right now, um, if you buy real estate in the long run, I, I very rarely seen people lose. Right. You know, if you have to have a fire sale and you got to get rid of it, yeah, sometimes. But if you can, if you can go it for the long game, uh, real estate is a really great investment. Nice. Nice. That's what I've always thought, right? Yeah, Excellent. absolutely. Excellent. Thank you, my absolutely. friend. And it's absolutely a pleasure. Total pleasure. And I'm glad we connected. And let's stay connected. Yeah. It, right. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Any way I can help, let me know. Love to love to love to help. Excellent. Have a great day. Enjoy. You too. All right. Take care. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll be back with a new episode and a new guest. You can find all episodes of the Coaching Call podcast on Apple, Anchor, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and wherever you listen to podcasts. I ask that you please leave me an honest review. This episode was made possible by listeners like you. If you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and buy me a cup of coffee. Make it a large. I'm trying to keep this episode free of advertisements. Anything you can donate to the cause is greatly appreciated. To donate, go to paypal.me backslash Sifu Raphael. Thank you and I really appreciate your help.